And I had a really good mentor that one day pulled me aside and said, Hey, don't get stuck in this rat race of corporate America. Like you're, you're destined for bigger things. Um, and please, please leave. Um, which was weird to hear my boss sort of, of, of all people tell me. And so I did. You're listening to the real FI podcast, where we discuss time tested tricks, techniques, and strategies for pursuing financial independence today so that we can enjoy a better tomorrow. A better tomorrow. Financial independence isn't about getting rich quick. It's about cultivating a foundation to grow financially, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Let's figure out how to kick the nine to five. Here are your hosts, Patrick and James. First question though, is there beer in that mug? <laughs> no, man, this is, I uh, got some coffee. I got to keep me going. It's hard to show the coffee, but there's coffee in there, I promise. Okay. Fair enough. All right, cool. All right, so we're, are we recording? Yeah, I mean, this is part of the interview already, so uh, let's keep All going. right, excellent. James <laughs> is drinking Farmer. James is drinking coffee because he's got to get the crops later. How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to The Real FI Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick McGrath, with my co-host, James Ripion. How's it going today, James? James, the farmer, Ripion here. It's going well, man. And for those on video, if you can see it, I got a fresh new hat. Uh, everyone's used to me wearing uh, this farmer UNC hat backwards, but I'm wearing a new hat that Patrick so generously got me. Decide, commit, take action. Except mine's backwards, I think, on the video. So I changed mine to mirror it so people could read it, James. That's that's how technology works these days. But we got a great guest today. We are extremely excited. We've had back to back hard hitters with uh tons of units. We got TJ in the house. How's it going today, TJ? Good guys. How are you guys? I'm doing good, TJ. Fantastic. So- I want you to get us started, TJ, by giving us a little bit of background on yourself. You know, get fill in our listeners. Like, who are you? Where'd you come from? Sure. And lead us up until today. Sweet, man. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, my name's TJ Kermeens. I'm in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I started, um, I started being in love with like entrepreneurship and business when I was, I was young. My family owns a bunch of, um, franchises of a large battery company. And, uh, I loved it. I, I grew up in it. Um, I watched everyone in my family be be very successful with that. Um, I too got into it until I realized that I just I wanted to do something different, not necessarily one way or the other better, but uh, something different and something of my own journey. And so uh, I, I left I left that to uh, to get into uh, title insurance of all things. Um, I moved to city of, I moved to city of Chicago from Michigan, and um, my wife pushed me to uh to think outside the box a little bit um started in title insurance i watched kids younger than me making hundreds of thousands of dollars per transactions and it was just killing me i'm like what am i what am i doing wrong and so um i just invested a lot of my time into kind of learning um podcast books um uh sitting down with mentors of mine sitting down with clients of mine actually and saying you know how how is this possible And uh, so I went from that and I had a really good mentor that one day pulled me aside and said, hey, don't get stuck in this rat race of corporate America. Like you're you're destined for bigger things. um, And please, please leave, Um, which was weird to hear my boss sort of 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 all people tell me. And so I did. I I went out there. I journeyed out, um, learned a little bit about project management, property management, um, did some brokerage work for a little bit. And then uh, I, I. started uh investing in single family real estate um doing flips and it was it was fun it was exciting it was sexy um but it wasn't as fun as waking up having money in my my account after uh after doing some hard work and getting getting some passive income so um i put a lot of time and effort into kind of switching gears from that multi or from the single family to the multi-family side of it and um and so here we are now man uh, i kind of just took off it started with some small duplexes and and uh, and a quad and now we're at nearly um nearly 400 units a little under uh 12 million uh, under management and raised uh just over 7 million in the process of that so man that is extremely impressive and i know majority of our listeners out there are at that duplex quadplex stage yeah. And, you know, I'm sure all have hopes and dreams of getting to that place where they have a couple hundred units, tons of passive income, you know, 
and have built a solid net worth and the fi financial freedom for themselves. And I think it would really help to kind of peel back the onion a little bit and, you know, talk about those steps from, you know, a duplex, quadplex to getting into a 50 unit or a 30 unit. Like, how did you do it? <laughs> and what were the kind of the steps in place to go from there to here, you know? Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting journey. So, I mean, funny enough, um, you know, I bought my first duplex, I bought my, my first quadplex and, you know, I knew I wanted to do bigger. I, I honestly, I had no idea how, right. And so, so, I mean, to start at that point, the education process was the biggest part, learning what I didn't know, trying to figure out as much as I can before I, I jumped into something that I, I might be in over my, uh, in over my boots on. So, um, I just, I, I, I saturated myself uh, with, with as much information as I could about, um, I would call it medium size, uh, like apartment buildings, um, trying to learn the ins and outs. How do I underwrite it? How do I find it? Who do I talk to? How do I source the deals? Um, and I went to this conference in, um, 2019 and I was sitting down talking, um, or sorry, I was listening to the speaker kind of talk about like their journey and how, you know, how, if you're raising money for flips, like what if you raise that same 200,000 and raised it for an apartment complex that paid you every month? And I got thick. I was like, man, I, I know I can do that. And I had raised at that point about just shy of a, a million dollars for all my single family flips. So I was like, man, what could a million buy me? And so I thought a little bit harder about it. And um, I went out and I told my attorney, I said, Hey, I, I really want to buy 50 units this year. And he goes, welcome to syndication. I said, I, don't know what that is. And so again, uh, kind of had a study up on it. And I'm like, this is exactly what I want to do, right? I want to put together all of these investors that are like minded that believe in me that believe in the journey that believe in the idea of, of passive income and financial freedom, um, and, and financial independence and, and, and take those people and, and find these properties deploy their capital and be able to provide, you know, a substantial return to them, um, back secured by by an asset. And so uh, I went out, I went to all the people that um, I had done private money loans from before, and I talked to them about the syndication process. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and then nobody wanted to do anything with their money. And I was like, well, I'm knee deep in this deal. I, I have to now, you know, I can't back out of it. And so um, I ended up, uh, I ended up raising $930,000 from 17 investors of which 15 I had never met. Um, I only had two people that were private money lenders in my before and single family that actually came on board with me, um, raised the money. We closed on a, on a Thursday on a 48 unit. And, um, on that Thursday, I was turning away money. We had, we were oversubscribed by about $400,000. And so I was like, well, this works. Let's do it again. Okay, great, the next great one. problem to have my friend. Yeah. 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 But, but here's, here's even the better part. And my attorney, my attorney still to this day, I'm really good friends with him. Um, he despises the decision I made, but we look back on it and laugh. Now my finance, my, my finance contingency was, was coming to a close. And he said, Hey man, what do you have raised? And at the time I had only raised like 450 K. So I still had 500,000 I had to raise and I had 15 days basically to do it. And he said, uh, so we're going to cancel it. I said, no, we're going to do it. And he goes, TJ, you, you can't. You've got 50K. That is earnest money. That's going to go hard. You're going to lose it all. And, and no offense, but you can't afford to do that. And I said, well, we're going to do it. I'm going to figure out a way. So we reached out to the seller. He gave us uh, 30 more days. And I had to put down another 50,000 that went hard that day. So I had $100,000 that was basically going to be hard in less than 24 hours and I had no option but to but to make it work and so that Tuesday when I was getting ready to close he said like we sat down we had a dinner and I'm like said well we did it and he goes no you you did it and I said no this was this is a collaborative thing like if you didn't believe in me if you didn't trust in me that we wouldn't have gotten to where we're at right now and and the investors and you know I you know being transparent with them like hey guys we're we're at we're at the brink right now you know um, but it, it was all, it was all, uh, it all turned out good in the end. The seller was incredible. I still talk to him this day and he actually, um, yeah, that's a great story too, but he, he actually is, is, was super pivotal in making sure that we got our first deal, which was a 48 unit, um, property. So it was really cool.
So yeah, tell us a little bit about this deal specifically. You said you raised nine hundred and thirty for it. You know, what was yeah. the final purchase price? Kind of, you know, what kind of asset are we looking at? Tell us the location. Give us all those fun details to kind of paint the picture of the deal for us. Sure. So it was kind of odd. It was a portfolio deal. Um, it was one sixteen unit, and then quick math, uh, what seven or eight four uh, uh, quadplexes all together, but they were all within a mile and a half of each other. And he had, um, the seller had actually built four of them, um, ground up development on four of them. So he was, you know, we were the second owner on these, but he had it listed. Um, after I left that conference, I was telling you about, um, I went to my brokers and I said, Hey, this is kind of what I'm looking for. And within a couple of weeks, I get this kind of off market thing, but it was, it was being vetted as a, um, or kind of being pushed as a two point, uh, two point seven million dollar purchase. And I did my underwriting and I said, hey, I can't go any more over 2.1 where I felt comfortable. So I offered him 2 million thinking there's no way. Um, and he came back and said uh, 2.5. And I just, I said, hey, I went back to the broker. I said, I can do, I can do 2.1 and that's my max. <clears throat> and um, I get a phone call and it's the seller. And the seller says, uh, hey, which is obviously unconventional, right? But I get a phone call from him and said, hey, I saw your journey. I saw your story. I read, you know, who you are. Um, I don't have kids to leave this to. I don't have a family to leave this to. I just kind of want to move to Florida and just ride off to the sunset. So if I can build, uh, help build your legacy, which is the name of all of our companies right over here, somewhere right there, um, then 2.2 uh, is the price. Um, can you do it? I said, I, I can do it. So we ended up uh, settling on 2.2. He was super awesome with regards to our timeline and our due diligence. Um, he knew it was our first deal. So, I mean, he probably over uh, overindulged in all of the necessities. I mean, he was hands-on from the beginning to the end, um, was there at the closing, um, left with a handshake and a hug. And he said, hey, uh, do you want to buy my self-storage units too? Um, so I, I haven't bought those yet, but they are definitely, <laughs> I'm, uh, they're very close to being a, a potential uh, asset we're looking at. So um, I think it just kind of went back to the whole idea though, is like, you know, we're, we, you know, when we start this journey, like you never know who you're going to run into. You never know what the deal is going to look like. And so we just, we were transparent with everything, you know, it's our first deal. You know, this is what we're looking for. I, I don't know what I don't know. Can you help me out with all of this? And I found that, you know, that, that through our journey now has been the best course of action of just straight up saying like, listen, here's what we need. How are we going to get there? What do you need from me? What do I need from you? And, and if it's going to work great, if it's not, let's just call a spade a spade and let's walk away from this. Right. But, um, you know, we've made a deal that if we get something under contract, we're going to close. And uh, we've never not closed on a deal today that we've we've gotten under contract. So I think that's really important. You put yourself in a vulnerable position uh, and letting yeah. the seller know that, like, you, you wanted his help to get you across the finish line with the yeah. deal. And I think, you know, that comes all comes off a lot differently than trying to be arrogant, pretending, you know, what you know, everything. Um, and, you know, put you in a position to have more of a collaborative experience with the seller on the other, other side of the table. Um, right. So, and, and I think that might've benefited you way more than maybe you would have anticipated it. It would have benefited you. I think so too. I think that the idea that the, the seller was in my shoes one time, right? Like everybody had their first deal they bought. And I thought, I think it brought him back to that, that original, you know, that time when he, when he bought that 16 unit and when he started developing and, he was just, he was very, he was very blunt. I mean, which was great because that's how I work. Um, he was very blunt. He was very to the point, but he was also very, he was just understanding, right? It was like, listen, um, here's why this. And I was like, ah, I didn't even know. And so, you know, I feel like, you know, every deal you're in, if you didn't learn something from it, you know, the passive income and the money is great, but like, you know, I have a list and it's kind of funny. Um, it's actually at my house, but it's like, the beginning of like all the things I needed a closing. Right. And it was like in, in black ink. And now it's like, there's like, <laughs> there's like 12 different colors ink of all the things I learned. And I did it intentionally so that I, I just remembered, you know, where these deals came from. What did I learn from each one of these deals that now we, we put into kind of what we're growing, um, you know, growing big picture. So. That's awesome. So I have a question here. So 0.2 million, it's 550,000 for the, you know, 25%. Did you have to bring more than that? And I, you obviously raised some money to do some renovations to increase the right. rents and all of that. So I'm just trying to help the listeners out here because, 
you know, no one's really put together a big deal like that majority of them, I think. So sure. break down kind of what that $930,000 went to just off of memory, you know? Yeah. So, so um, we actually put 30% down um, on it. So we did, um, we had the 30% down. We had um, our cash reserves that we built into the deal. We had acquisition fees that we built into that, which is a whole new side of things that when I, I didn't know was even a thing. Um, and then we had uh, our repairs, um, uh, our immediate repairs that we needed, that we felt we needed on the deal too. So we we raised all that money up front to acquire the property for the down payment, get paid to acquire the property for our asset management fee or for our acquisition fee. Our, uh, our immediate needs for repairs and maintenance um, and then our cash reserves to make sure that we were we were protecting you know the asset uh, long term and that totaled uh, that totaled nine hundred and thirty thousand dollars yeah and that's really important and I, I just want people to hear that is because you know you're not just raising the money for the down payment and the closing cost you're raising the money for the reserves you're raising the money for your acquisition fee which means you brought everybody together. So once the deal goes across the closing table, you receive payment for putting that all together. Usually that is a percentage of the total purchase price of the property. And then you also make money on managing the asset over the course of its lifespan. Sure. Um, so that's you know how syndication really works. Um, did you put any of your own money into this deal or was it all uh, investors? Not a penny. Nope. Um, to this day, I have not put an actual penny of my own money into any of my deals. Um, we've done so. We've had some kickback from investors like, what's their skin in the game? Um, and we've, you know, I, I have my answer to that and said, here's the deal. Um I guess in the spirit of transparency, I, I look at like my acquisition fees, right? I, I look as those, those were never my money. Um, that was my investor's money that came through was to get paid for my hard work. So what I've always done is sort of taken that initial money that I have. I take a percentage of that. I roll it into my next deal as a limited partner. Um, so my management company there. So do I have money, I guess, in it? Sure. Um, but it was never my immediate cash that I ever had. It was all stuff that was based off my passive income that I was reinvesting back into me and my deal. Um, which is the power of syndication, right? I mean, the fact that I can be a general partner, I can be a limited partner in all of this, I can make money on both sides. And the way we structured it was advantageous for our investors, short term, long term, and and just future legacy leaving, um, which I think was it, it was pivotal in us growing at a, the, the the rate rate we grew at. So, gotcha. yeah. So, do you go ahead, James? I was going to say, you know, and I know a lot of people are probably curious about this from the back end on how syndications are kind of put together, uh, more so the operator side of things. Can you, you know, you, you've talked about the acquisition fee a little bit and that's yeah. where, where some of your compensation is coming from. But as far as the whole picture goes for a syndication, can you tell our listeners kind of how that works uh, on your side of things of how you're getting compensated? Um, what else you're, you're doing other than the acquisition fee? Absolutely. Yes. So in, in the midst of the, the acquisition fee after close, um, you know, best case scenario, it's already cash flowing, right? Um, we obviously have work that we're going to have to do. So we're, we're improving the property. We're deploying capital to, to increase the rents, increase the, you know, the, the NOI um, on the property. But as the property is going, I also take an asset management fee. And so my day's work, um, though I don't make a salary, um, my day's work is paid on the work that I'm doing from, you know, from the cash flow from those properties, from how I deploy it to um, our game plan, our project management, all of that. So as I'm working with the property manager, the project manager, you know, that the, the leases are getting done and, and I'm, I'm executing our, um, you know, our game plan for renovations, I'm getting a percentage at the end of the year. I pay out quarterly, but at the end of the year, I get a certain percentage of those profits for work that I did. Um, on top of that, you know, there's the, the cash flow, which is obviously paying our investors. Um, I get a portion of that as well. And so, so the way I structured my first ever deal was I didn't have a, a pref. I didn't have that, you know, that, that preferred return on anything. I just had straight cash flow split. And so what I did was I said, 80% of my cash flow is going to go to you guys. So if that comes out to be 6%, 
Um, I'm not doing my job. If it comes out to 20%, I've done really well and we need to start figuring out how we're going to make that right. But I think my very first deal, the very first year we projected out like 10.8% um, on the first one, which we thought was pretty conservative. And I think we hit close to 12 and a half percent. So I was pretty happy with all of that. Um, and so I give 80% of my cash flow to them. And I take 20% until I give them all of their money back, right? And so these investors are getting paid every quarter um, on the work that we're doing. And uh, once I, the way I had it structured is once I paid all of their money back, then it flipped. And now I get 80% of the cash flow. You get 20% in perpetuity. And you're going to get 20% of the profits when we sell. And so it made it super enticing for them that they, they had a zero investment basis once I gave them their money back and they were going to make money for as long as I held that property for, right? Um, and so we, you know, I get paid on, on the limited partner side, the general partner side, which is the management side. Um, I get paid as an asset manager for, you know, for managing the property. Um, and then that asset management fee, obviously in the beginning, which was, which is a nice, you know, lump sum to take care of some stuff. So that, that really is. And for everybody out there, you know, you can put a, a syndication deal together, however you, you want to, you know, you can do a pref, which is a preferred return. And then once, um, your investors get their money back, they could be out of the deal, but they got their certain percentage. You know, you could do a waterfall, which is as the asset um, returns continue to climb, you know, over time, you'll get more and more and more for the asset performing higher and higher. I really love how it flipped afterwards. Um, is the ultimate is the ultimate goal with most properties to sell them within that, you know, five year, seven year balloon time frame? um and trade up to something else or, or it would be yeah it would be hard pressed for me to ever sell that property um but where i guess where you're going with that is i have properties right now that i am selling that i've owned for 18 months um that we we got in and the market's great right now and we're reaping the benefits of the the short amount of time that we had but the work that we put in um so i mean i've got i've got a property right now that's a 12 unit we bought for 660 and I'm selling it for a million one. Um, I've got a property 24 unit that I bought for 800 that I'm selling for a million two. And I've only owned those for 16, 18 months, you know? So, so um, those ones, obviously we're in and out. I'll pay my investors back and then I'll take my, my profits on the back end for the, for the 80, the 20. Um, and then there's some other properties that like, I, I don't know that I'll ever get rid of. I really don't. Um, I think that we bought them at such a really good time with regards to price and discount that we've done a bunch of work that once I turn it around, I could, I'll never have to work again with just the two properties, you know, two of the properties that I'm thinking of. Um, so in, in theory, my hundred, hundred of my units that I have right now that I probably won't get rid of, I could live off the rest of my life, um, comfortably live off the rest of my life. I like that. So, you know, as you, as you're talking about how you're doing all your deals and transactions right now, um, some, I got, a, I got a flag going off in my head and it's, taxes, <laughs> you know, uh, so are, are you looking to 1031 exchange any of these deals or is that sort of a roadblock that appears with syndications and syndicated deals? Cause you know, I, I've kind of thought through this, I haven't even explored uh, what the answer is. So maybe, you know, uh, maybe sure. you can enlighten us. What's the, what's the tax implication for selling a syndicated deal? And are you able to 1031 into another deal? Yeah. So I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to 1031 exchange my side, my ownership into something else. Um, the nice part about that is the general partnership piece that I own, right. Is separated from the limited partnership for multiple different reasons. One of which um, for us is because I can, I can take those proceeds and 1031 into something. Um, and in theory, right, if I've done my job, I can now not even have to bring on an investor for a deal. I can actually now own that outright and just have full, you know, full ownership into these properties. Um, again, on uh, reaping the benefits of the hard work that we did in the beginning. Um, there is a scenario, um, and I've, I've, you know, not giving financial advice by any means, but there is a scenario where my accountant and I have talked about taking, just taking some of the proceeds and doing what we need to with it. Um, looking at outside ventures to be able to um, kind of diversify um, with regards to the passive side of things. So 
I think it's situational, certainly. Um, and it's, it's really, it would really behoove you, uh, you, the listener, the, whatever, to really know what your end game is when you get in so that it's, it's structured correctly. Cause it's, it's very difficult, you know, in the midst of it all to switch that all around. Right. So I kind of had an idea of what I wanted to do with each one of these properties. And be, before I got into it, I spoke with my accountant, spoke with my attorney and said, here's what I'm going to do. Here's the, the game plan. Here's the option one that I have option two, what's the best, you know, how do I set this up? And, um, that's why I, that's why, that's why they get paid the big bucks to, to make sure that that's all taken care of. And they've done a, they've done a good job with that. So. Exactly. And that's, that's extremely important for anyone out there to make sure that you have, um, a good attorney, a good tax professional that you can talk through these things. You should be talking to them before you buy these assets or before <laughs> you're refinancing or before you're selling to kind of put the best strategy in place for you and make sure that um, your tax liabilities are going to be covered. Because the last thing you want to do is think you made 400 grand and end up owing a ton because you don't have the write-offs or you can't 1031 exchange or you can't do some of the things that you thought that you could do because of your partnerships and other things that you have attached to the deal where you know, you could get yourself in a bind. So I think that's the extremely important, especially when you're playing, you know, at the level that you're playing with, it really comes down to your team. Um, most importantly, right? Right. No, I think that's, that's huge. And I, I have, um, you know, I teach a lot of the investors that I work with. I, I have a course that I, I have that, um, you know, when I bring in these, these students, whatever, you know, one of the, the very first step for me is, is teaching them how to build a team. What, what does that team look like? What does it look like to you? Because it's it's all going to be situational, right? Um, I think each person should have, you know, their baseline of who needs to be in there. But some people are going to be, you know, higher net wealth right off the bat, right? Um, some people are coming in the ground floor. So like where and not to say that that doesn't that doesn't mean that you should have and, and pursue to have what, you know, the, the higher net wealth has, which is, I think is the end game, right? But um, getting in at the ground floor, like there are some different things that you really need to focus on because you don't have the luxury of making a big mistake. Um, right. And so, so having that knowledge, having that education coming in, having that right team, that's going to back you and, and support you is, is gigantic. Yeah. Perfect. And so you what know, would you say? Oh, Patrick, take it, man. Go. <laughs> I was just, I was just going to ask. So for the listeners out there, what would you say, you know, the top three people, that you would need on your team if you're going to try to take down a syndication, whether that's, you know, a million dollar deal um, or, you know, something larger than that, who would be the top three most important people? I've been asked this uh, a lot of times and every time I get laughed at at the third person, but it's the, it's the genuine truth. I think the first is um, in, in first and second or in whatever order you, you can make it happen, but a, uh, an attorney that understands um, SEC, um, SEC guidelines, who preferably uh, has transactional history, right? That is that can kind of tag both sides of it. A CPA that um, uh, that invests in real estate themselves. Um, I, I do think that's important because I think that there's a mindset shift when you also are a, a a real estate investor of knowing exactly what I'm thinking of outside of just your your accountant hat um your, you have your investor hat and then i think whether it is a, your your spouse your mom your dad whatever you need you need someone that is going to support you through and through um to to the end and and, and luckily i've outkicked my coverage and i've got a great wife that um you know when it's when it's a bad day she's she is right there to pick me up and when it's a good day she's she's right there to knock me down too so um, it's, it's, it's a perfect mix of that. Um, having that support is huge, right? Cause it's not easy. Um, it, it is not easy. Um, people make it look easy. Um, people that are, are well-educated that are well, well, you know, versed in all of this can make it look easy, certainly, but I didn't know what I didn't know. And there were nights where I was, I was, I didn't sleep. I mean, there were times I was trying to raise money at four o'clock in the morning. Um, and, and without, you know, without that support, man, it wouldn't have happened. It just wouldn't. I love it. Yeah, that's super important. I think when you have, you know, a good family situation behind you, it allows you to align some of those business endeavors uh, much easier and without without a higher level of stress, for sure. Um, going back to your first two teammates there, are they investing yeah. in your deals? Are they getting uh, a slice of the pie here? 
Um, because you made a comment earlier that you know, oh, that's why they get paid the big bucks. But I don't know, man. I think you're getting paid the big bucks, and they're working for you. Um, but you know, tell us, are are they investing in your deals too? So funny. Um, so my accountant is not. Um, which I I give him grief about. Um, I was well, just in Las Vegas with he's him. He's listening today. You know, we're gonna kick him <laughs> kick him in the butt over the video. You call. should. Oh, you should. You I should um. I um. I was just in Las Vegas with him um, uh, not too long ago. So uh, I, we talk regularly and, and, uh, and then funny, funny, the, the attorney um, is actually now uh, a business partner in our new venture. So currently um, everything I've done, I've done with a, uh, either myself or I had a small, uh, not a small, I had a, I had a business partner that played a role in everything. So on the smaller side, um, but I've recently, um, just trying to think big, right? Trying to, trying to go and, and, you know, I'm a small dude, small town dude from, from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I want to be, you know, I, 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 I want to be someone big. Um, I want to own thousands of units. And so I talked to my attorney about it and um, he said, well, let's start a fund. Let's get this going. Let's raise some money. So um, I'm currently in the midst of raising 20 million for, for legacy real estate group, which is our company um, looking to buy, you know, buy some substantial, uh, substantial, uh, assets. And, uh, he has become a business partner in that. So. I love that. And I think, um, what's super important there is you're aligning your teammates interests and you and the success that you have. Um, yeah. I don't think you're going to go way further because of that. I think, you know, a lot of times when people look to hire, uh, people on their team, whether it's a real estate agent or the attorney, they're always cost conscious, you know, they're like, sure. I don't pay more than I have to, but you know, now you're at the point where you're kind of giving up some of the pie and making them so invest with well, your attorney at least your accountant will work on him. Right. But, you know, so invested <laughs> into the deal that you know you have to succeed because your success is tied to their success, and you're taking Correct. that beyond beyond the billable hour. Um, and I'll tell you this much: you know, when you align incentives like that, um, you're you're going to get a better product in the end because they're they're going to care that much more as a result because they're not just sure. the hourly wage or their you know their fee at the end of it. Um, so I, I support that 100. percent and he he is um i i cannot speak uh <laughs> he is so, he's such an amazing man um he is uh he is one of my biggest supporters in everything um when i told him i was going to do this i mean he kind of joked but he said like you want a partner and i was like is it you and he's like yep i said in a heartbeat let's do this so um you know his family and my family um are close um his sons his daughter and i are are close um, so it's a, it's a, it's a cool connection there, but we, we had a sit down and I, I think this was important also is like, listen, this doesn't ruin what we have, right. We're going to do this together. We understand where this could go. We also understand where it couldn't go. Um, and let's make sure that we, we have an understanding of where it's going to be, you know, what that's going to look like. And I know it's easier said than done certainly, but, um, you know, I look at him every day and I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm amazed in where we've kind of gone together. Um, and now the fact that he kind of was so in on that, that he wanted to be a partner in it. Um, and it, it's just going to push us in a really cool direction. And we've got, we've got uh, three other business partners that we, we brought on who are all in their own rights, just uh, amazing uh, what they do. I think we've assembled a, a, a heck of a team. So it's exciting to, to kind of project and see where the future is going to go. Is this uh is there an age difference between you and this attorney? Um, you know, I'm trying to just grasp mm -hmm. kind of like what the what the relationship is. If it's like mentor mentee kind of feeling for his part, mm -hmm. or if it's like a more peer collaborative uh, situation. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is my favorite part of of this journey um, thus far. Is uh, so when I started in title insurance, right? Um, my first client was my now attorney. And I did a lot of deals with him and we did a lot of transactions um, uh, that he represented sellers on and, and investors on. And I just became just highly respected who he was, what he did, his whole process, his family, just, it, we just had a really good connection. Right. Um, so he is, uh, he is uh, 60. So I'm 35. Um, he is a, he's a father figure at times. He is my best friend at times. Um, he's just, he's just a good dude. Um, and then my other partners and I, um, yeah, they're not, I mean, we're not too far off in, in age, so uh, early 40s. So I'm the youngest of them all. Um, and they they like to give me crap about that, which which I can take it on the chin. So I'm, I'm good to go. But we're um, we're a really good team. And he's he's just, uh, you know, he's willing to step up at any time. 
Um, he's helped raise money. Obviously, he's he's just he's he's a good dude. Yeah, good dude. That makes me man. Happy, man. I love hearing that. Yep. Me too. And I I love hearing you know, so the partnership aspect. Like you you when you're getting to that level, you know you've got to have a great partner, sure. not one, sure. but usually a few. So you found your partner. Now you've built a team. So tell us what the ultimate goal is like what are you building you alluded to a little bit there but you know break that down for us on what that vision is like how many number of doors the cash flow like and what time frame are you looking for so i'll i'll take that uh i'll i'll start with the end in mind here is um everything we do is built around legacy um it is something that uh i don't know what you what your thoughts are but um i uh, i vision board religiously um and i actually put the word legacy on down um and and i didn't know what that meant i didn't know why there you go at a boy look at that and i i put it on there and i i felt that um i don't know i just i felt this strong sense of leaving something bigger than myself behind right um and i i have two little boys at home that i want to i want to make proud um I want them to see the hard work that mom and dad put into this. Um, and, and so the end game for us is we want to be able to make a substantial impact for uh, children that are at risk in areas that we decide to purchase in. Um, so it's bigger than just, um, it's just it's bigger than TJ. It's bigger than legacy real estate group. Um, uh, so we, we want to be able to provide those opportunities for the less fortunate um, in, in certain scenarios. Uh, as far as numbers wise goes, we're raising 20 million. Um, and if correctly deployed, we're at about 60 to 70 million of what that would buy us. Um, I would like that to be around 1500 to 1700 doors um, is where we're, we're hoping to be. Um, the end game ultimately with that is to uh, to be able to obviously to create uh, financial independence, both for, for, uh, our main group, our general partnership, but also to leave a, a, a legacy behind for our, our limited partners and our investors that are going to be able to say and be proud of what they, they invested in and say, you know, we invested with these guys and here's their story and here's what happened and um, and, and just looking to make make a bigger impact than than uh, than I was able to before. So that was always the, the end game. My wife comes from a, uh, a social work background. And she now stays at home with my two little boys, and and it, and it sort of felt like this perfect combination of like generating this 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 cash flow and this this wealth. And it was like, what what do we do with it, right? Like we don't need to live this like wildly luxurious life. Like we'll take advantage of what we can, but like there are people that can't. And and I've got two boys that I just to be able to look at and say like we did it all, man. We did everything we could. Um, and then, and hopefully one day if they decide to, they can take this over and, and continue to carry that on and on and on and, and leave the legacy we're looking to, to leave. Perfect. So how, how are you personally measuring kind of what your goals are? I mean, you, you had mentioned you're raising 20 mil to get you up to about 1500, 1700 units, but how, how is TJ and TJ's family looking at this? Is it a, is it a cash flow benchmark? Is it a, a number of deals per year for the acquisition fees that you're kind of measuring? Like, how are you looking at this for your personal life? Yeah, I think it's 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 varied as we grow, right? Um, things have kind of you know taken taken a, a a different turn. We've taken some you know luxuries with regards to the work that we put in, but um, just I mean, if we're just being frank, I mean, my ultimate goal, I've already really like where I need to be passively, I'm already there. Um, so where do we want to continue to be? Is um, I, I from the from from this aspect would like to be around bringing in about two fifty to three hundred k of just passive, which I one hundred percent know we can do. Um, we're well into that, um, over halfway there with regards to where we're at now. Um, and then it, it's more for us, and I know it sounds kind of sounds corny, but it's more of a give back for for us at that point. So we want to be able to take a strong percentage of that and give that all all back as well. So. My family and I, we live, you know, we live a frugal life. I mean, we don't have, you know, crazy nice things. We live in a pretty nice house, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's not super expensive. Um, uh, I still haven't fixed my car that I got T-boned in a couple of weeks ago. Um, like we're just, you know, I like to do nice things and go nice places, but I just don't need 
what this this is bringing us. Um, I want it so that we can be able to do more, give more, and and, and kind of be involved in more. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't think that that that's corny at all. I mean, almost every single successful real estate investor, you know, making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year already, that's young and it's building something. Everyone is working to be able to give back. Every everyone has that idea of it's something more than money. When you don't have any money, the the first goal is you know to hit the money aspect, and then once you're comfortable and okay, you know you you have that next driving factor, which is sure. the legacy sure. that you're building for you know your kids, the legacy that you're building to help out your community, and and with that, you you ultimately help yourself. But you you need you need some other you know passion and some other driving factor behind it than than just money. Like you said, it, it's not all about you know living the laps of luxury, uh, you know out there that everybody thinks. Oh, you know, four hundred doors, you know, must be a nice fifteen hundred, you know, seventeen hundred doors. Like that that sounds crazy. But when when you're doing it for the right reasons, it doesn't sound crazy at all. And I think it's, it's, it is, you know, looking back in the beginning, it seemed very unobtainable um, until it got going. And it was like, okay, so like, you know, it's, it's tested, it's, it's, it works, we can tweak it, we're going to, you know, we're going to make this what we want, what we need it to. But, you know, man, I was naive, right? I was naive to how this all looked. I would look at the people I look up to now and I'm like, man, they make this look easy. But I, I guarantee if they look back in the beginning and, and they, they, they're genuine with their, their story, it wasn't as easy. They make it look now, man. And, and, you know, I, I, I think you you have to take the good with the bad, right? You got to take that. Like I had the, the goal of living off my passive income. Um, I wanted to leave corporate America and never have to turn back again. Um, we've done that. I want to be able to have my wife stay at home and raise my two little boys. Um, we've done that. Um, now it's, you know, at what point have we, have we reached enough? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know exactly what that that totally entails, but I do know that you know, as we grow, we're we're doing the right things. Um, and and you know, for for that for that, um, you know, I think it all comes down to at the very you know very beginning of when we started this is we had our our core values that we just have never strayed from, um, to the point where we've turned down investors that didn't align with us. Um, we just didn't see it as as a fit. Um, And I think that's super important of having, like I said, having the end in mind, but knowing in the beginning what, who and who and what you are, Um, because, you know, I've lost track of it. I've lost sight of, you know, who I was in the beginning. And I, I looked back and I was like, let's get aligned. Let's do this. Like, you know, let's, let's be better. You know, this is, this is what we're here for. So I do think that's super important to kind of remember, remember this beginning, certainly, and, and kind of grow from there. I think you're you're in the midst of the the mindset mindset shift between um, it's kind of like survival scarcity almost self doubt to to that like abundance um, and unlimited options and and abilities um, and, and sure. that comes after you reach a certain level of financial security. Frankly, um, so like and you had mentioned, like you kind of have that passive income number about 300 and then after that like your mind's already going for where you can do all these self-actualization uh tasks you know start the charitable charitable organization and start giving back and you know i'm yeah. sure at that point like your business is just going to skyrocket because you know you're, you're not operating from like a, a place of um you know need it's just like how can we kick ass every day yeah and i but i i do feel like um i do feel like that that how do I word this? I do feel like that, I don't say scarcity, but that like desire and need for success is, is important. Um, there are days that I just don't feel hungry enough. That makes sense. Like I don't feel like it I'm, does. I'm do I, that I'm, that I'm doing enough and it, it beats me up, man. I'll come home and I'm super just disappointed in, in what I did or didn't do. Um, but you know, that, that hunger, that need is, is it's gotta be there every day. Um, I think, I, I, I think to your point, like it kind of drops a little bit, obviously with the, the level of security, but if I'm not hungry to go out there, um, I know I'm not going to be given my best, um, in it all. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a coach. I had a great coach growing up, um, that was, you know, that corny, you know, like give it 110%, but like, he was like, give it 110%, everything you do. And, 
And my, my parents were really good at pushing that. My family, everybody was like, you know, you don't just jump in half ass. You you do this and you're going to either you're either in or you're out. Um, and there's I mean, don't get me wrong. There's days where it's like I might be out um, and, and I need that. And, and, you know, one of my mentors said, you know what, the best thing you can do at that point is, you know, we joke now, but he's like, grab a coin, flip it heads, heads, you go home, tails, you go home, um, go home and just, just have a day. And I'm like, that's, that works. So there'll be days where it's like, nope, just go, just going home. This is not, not what I need. I don't need to be in the office. Um, again, sort of the luxury of, of, I guess, having that and building that. But um, then I, it, it sort of relets the fire, you know, relights the fire of, of that need and that desire to go out there to be hungry and, and get this done. So, right. So how do your how do your kids play into that a little bit? I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and they said, you know, I had one kid and, you know, I didn't feel super hungry. And then I had two kids and I was still kind of the same. But like, at you know, at two, three kids, like then like something shifted uh, and it was like, <laughs> you know, now it's time to work. Um, so yeah. like, you mentioned you had two younger kids. So um, do you think that's kind of played uh, an impact on kind of how you're approaching your business at all? 100 percent yeah i mean my my whole life everything i thought mattered um didn't the moment i held my first son um <laughs> it mindset mind shift uh you know mindset shift to the max right um but uh you know i i involve them um i i don't remember growing up talking about money with my family at all i i, I don't remember and my parents will say oh we did i'm like i don't think you did um but like my kids know. I mean, we talk about everything. They're they're soon to be six and three, and um, you know they have their their piggy banks, right? And we uh, we ask them if they want to invest, so they're they're investors in our deals. Um, and so we talk about their returns every quarter and what they made and how to invest. Um, which I've got two hilarious stories about about that right there. But um, yeah, they they're huge, man. They they you know I wake up in the morning excited. Um, looking at them, knowing that like, this is, this is for them. I mean, my wife and I worked our butt off to get where we're at. Um, I mean, full transparency, seven years ago, I had $12 in my bank account. Hmm. Tell us one of those funny stories, man. I'm, you can't just leave us hanging there. Yeah. So, so I'm big into Legos. If my screen wasn't blurred, you'd see Legos literally everywhere on my, my shelves back here. But um, used to as a kid and you uh, still to this day, I'm embarrassingly almost, um, hence the blurred screen. Um, but, uh, it was Christmas. It was coming up to Christmas last year. My five-year-old is, is a very bright kid. And, um, he said, dad, I want the Harry Potter Hogwarts castle. I was like, Kristen, that's, that's a $400 Lego set. And you're five. You're not getting, first off, no. Mm -hmm. Second, here's why. And third, don't, no, we're not doing that. That's not going to happen. And he's like, ah, and I said, well, mom and dad have a budget. You know, that's way outside the budget, buddy. We're not going to do that. He's like, okay. So he's like, you know, he wasn't upset or, you know, anything like that. He was just, you know, he was a little disappointed, but he was just like, oh, okay, whatever. And, you know, he talks about investing. We talk about investing. And a uh, few, uh, few days later, he comes up, he goes, Santa doesn't have the budget for it? I said, no, he doesn't. He's got the whole world, man. He's got he's to work out for all the kids, you know, everybody. And he just looks, shakes his head and goes, he really needs how to learn. He needs to learn how to invest better. Uh, that's, that's and I started laughing. I was like, "Yeah." And he goes, "Maybe you should invest with you." I was like, "Maybe I'll talk to him about that." But I really appreciate the appreciate the ego boost, man. So you know, my five year old pushing uh, pushing me to um, you know to do bigger things. So uh, and 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 the other one, just a quick one, is you know he asked me one day we're at the dinner table and we're talking about you know preschool and we're talking about my day at work and whatever. And he said, "Dad, what do you do?" I said, "Well, I, I flip homes for a living." And um, He's like, oh, okay. And I said, and then I, I, I get people that I want to make fun, you know, make money and they, they give it to me and I buy a building and then, you know, people pay me to live in my buildings and I fix them up and I do nice things. And then I give money back to the people that gave me their money and explain syndication in the best five-year-old terms I could. And he's like, okay, cool. And the next day he goes, dad, I'm calling baloney on you. So what do you mean? He goes, you're strong, but you're not Hulk strong. There's no way you flip houses. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like that's, that's pretty good, buddy. I said, you know, so I said, well, I take ugly houses. I make them look nice. That's called flipping. And, you know, kind of explain that. And he goes, and also, Dad, if people pay you to live in, in buildings that, they, that, that you own, 
why wouldn't they just use that money to buy something so people pay them? I'm like, yes, yes, we did it. We've done it. So I'm like my five-year-old understands investing. We've knocked it out. So uh, his first day of uh, kindergarten was um, last week. And their first thing that they asked, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up kind of thing? He goes, I want to do what dad does. Um, he still can't explain that to the teacher, but um, so uh, I think that it's a, it's a proud moment. So. My dad throws houses across Michigan for your dad. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. And, you know, we're big Marvel fans. So, you know, add that with the Legos and, and just being being nerdy that way. I mean, the first thing he went to is like, man, Hulk is really strong, but you are not like Hulk, dad. Mm-hmm. Like, nah, cool. thanks, buddy. The way to drop the ego down immediately with that, like, you know, make me make me look really bad and then just boost it right back up with, you know. Uh, we need to we need to learn how to invest better. So that's perfect. Man, that is fantastic, and I I love those two. And really appreciate you sharing those sure. and talking about investing better, you know, and building to seventy million in assets, you know, fifteen hundred to seventeen hundred doors, you know, building this legacy for your family. What obstacles do you do you see yourself facing? to be able to accomplish those goals, you know, over the next three to five years? First one for me is uh, I, I suffer terribly from this imposter syndrome um, of just thinking I'm not the right person. Like why me? Um, right. Like why would someone invest in TJ Kermins? Um It's that, that's, that's a rough one. Um, but outside of that, um, ultimately, you know, like what I what I did this all for and why I wanted to get in was I wanted to be, you know, present for my kids. Um, I wanted to not miss a thing. Um, I didn't want to miss a soccer game or, or, you know, a play or, you know, you insert any, you know, infinity um, options for that. Right. Um, and so I, I told my wife, I said, you know, they're young, right? They're young. They're not totally into things yet. Um not to say that it, that's okay to miss, but um, in my mind, but that first that first three years are going to be, it's going to be tough. I'm going to be taking a lot of time away, a lot of travel away until we get things established because I'm a very, you know, I'm, I'm very hands-on with the things I do. And I, I don't want to just have someone go to my property to do what I can, I can do myself, um, especially when I'm, I'm starting this, this fund with the idea that they're, they're believing in me, like my projects and, and my passion and my journey and, and, and what I'm going to do. I want to make sure that I go there, that I have that, that understanding. And then I can help somebody along the way, kind of fill those, those gaps for me. So taking the time away from my family certainly is going to be difficult. Um, the travel, um, which of course is always, there's always a burnout with that. Um, I find as much as I love traveling, I don't like planes all the time. Um, and we, we don't invest really near us. So it's, it's going to take a lot of that. Um, and 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 just just knowing that I'm like if this gets to where we need to be and we raise the money, we obviously we, we people believe in us. Um, people believe in our journey and who what we're going to do. So I need to to believe in myself. Um, reinvest into myself to 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 really make sure that I have a true understanding of me, my project, my journey, um, and I, I'm in the right mindset day after day, um, both on the financial side maybe the entrepreneur side, um, insert any, any other ones that I can find. If it's a good opportunity to bring on someone that, that can help me, um, reinvesting in myself and, and making sure that I'm doing the right stuff. Man, what absolute smash answers. Like I, I just loved all of it. It was, it was all personally wasn't focused really on any outside factors. It was building yourself up, um, to be able to accomplish those goals because you know, ultimately you are going to be the reason that you get there. So man, what a fantastic transition into the last segment of the show Oh boy, that James and I like to call the big Big. four. So take it away, James. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like uh, I love our corny intro to this thing. Um, It really hypes it up. (laughs) Um, So, all right. So this one, this is our financial independence hack question. So tell us something that you do, um, either in terms of your personal life or your business life that just feels like a financial independence hack, somewhat of a a cheat code. Oh boy. That's a good one. Um, I feel like, um, I feel like people spend a lot of time saying, like, I feel like a lot of people say they don't have time to do certain things. Right. I feel like that's, uh, that is, it's, it's, beaten up too much. I think that if you really do a, a deep dive in that, so um, I don't know, not everyone's the same as me, um, but certainly 
when I'm in the midst of something, you know, they said you can't read, like I can't read and work. It's like, no, but you, you can, um, like I do audiobooks. you know, I do like the podcast, I think taking advantage of your quote unquote downtime, uh, using that opportunity, it's, it's like driving time, right? If I'm on the road, I don't need music. Like that's my time to learn. Like that's, that's more time. So I'm plugging in my audiobooks. I'm plugging in, uh, the podcast to make sure that I'm just getting as much education as I possibly can. Um, so I guess that would, that would be probably paramount for me is not having that, that downtime. Don't get me wrong. I think take your personal time and do what you need to do. But if you have the opportunity to learn, like go out and learn um, and use that downtime as, as that opportunity. So that would be it. I don't know if that, that pacifies, but I think, uh, I think that's what I, I like to do. And I think it works out nicely for me. Well, that definitely does. And that ties perfectly into our second question, which is resources. So what books, podcast, or people have really shaped your financial independence journey and helped you get to where you are today? That's awesome. Uh, I'll start with my I'll start with my wife um, being being a person. She was super supportive from day one of what I wanted to do, what I wanted to accomplish. Um, pushed me. Um, supported me in, in, in everything. So person wise, I think my wife, Kimber has been fantastic, um, partner and all of that. Um, as far as a book, um, funny story, the company that I actually have, I actually can't show it. Um, it's a, it's my, it's my termination letter from a company I used to work for that, um, they terminated me. And that was my just drive to just be like, Nope, I'll never come back to something like this again. Um, and the owner of that company gave me a book called The $100 Startup. Um, and it's like something about like how to fire your boss and, and kind of like do the things you love. Um, and I was like, how ironic, right? Like I get fired from this guy. The book he gives me is like the book that sort of like, like, all right, we're going to do this. Um, so that book was, was awesome. It's simple. It's not, you know, crazy knowledge based, but it's more like a, a mindset. Like this is, this is like, how you can reinvent yourself. Um, so that book was awesome. And then podcast wise, um, I'm always listening to, you know, you know, the bigger pockets of the world, stuff like that. But um, there are a few people that just ultimately like social media wise that I, I can't get enough of. Um, I, I don't know if I can drop their names, but drop um, all of them. Give, give yep. them to yeah. our listeners. Yeah. yeah give Layla, them to our listeners. Layla and Alex Hermosi are next level. Amazing. Um, if you can't, learn from them you you probably should figure out what what, what you're missing um, or if you I, haven't seen a video by them uh, in the last two months you are not searching for the right stuff on tiktok or instagram or facebook you might not have a pulse you actually you exactly. might you might not have a pulse um i love um ryan panetta um he is you know if you're looking real estate wise he's great for that if you're looking financial literacy wise he's great for that if you're looking for like just real world he does a good job of being relatable um he's he's eccentric in sometimes but he's just he's got a really smart mind he's got a really cool journey and i like to like align myself with with people that have some like cool stories like that to go out there tell their story um make an impact um and, and I just, I, I connect, I connect with him. And then just, you know, I think on that note is, you know, if you're aspiring to be the best you can be in whatever profession it is, whatever, you know, whatever vehicle you, you choose to do is find that person that's already there and really like immerse yourself in who they are, what they are, how they do it. I guarantee they have more than just the real estate that they do. Um, and, and it's a lot of mind shift and, and having those coaches that help them along too. So uh, those people were, those are huge. And I, even though I don't have them as a personal coach, I think every day when I see their stuff, it's like, thanks coach. Appreciate that. On to, yeah, on to my next thing. Right. So yeah, great people. Couldn't agree more. All right, TJ. Um, here's our third question. It is five years in the future. All right. Where is TJ at in terms of his personal life and in terms of his business life? Like paint us a picture there. Yeah. So on my vision board, I have, um, I have a, a building here in Kalamazoo that I want to own. Um, and, and that was two years ago. So I'm three years away from making that happen. I had five years. I wanted to own that. 
Um, and I want to build out the top floor as Legacy Real Estate Group's kind of corporate home office um, to have all that there. I'd like to have a team under me that is um, built with just next level amazing people that are that are feeling the voids of, of my day to day, but also that are, are being able to be impactful um, and aligned with my core values and where I'm at. Uh, financially, what that looks like for me is um, I don't think I'll ever leave and stop doing what I'm doing. Um, I, I probably would take a less active role and find somebody that's, that's years down the road, 15, 20 years down the road of finding someone to kind of fill my spot. Um, I want to never, I, I don't want to have to, to ever, ever go back to corporate America. I know that we're in a really good spot and we're doing that, but things change on a dime, man. If I'm not reeducating myself and learning. Um, you never know what's going to happen. Um, potential big recession coming, small recession, downturn, whatever you want to call it now. Um, knowing how to to back that and how to support myself um, is is kind of where I need to be. Um, and then that, that five-year mark, um, I mean, I, I, at that point, we should, um, uh, I hope, <laughs> be fully raised on all of that and be fully deploying our capital for Legacy Real Estate Fund. Um, and growing, uh, um, you know, our portfolio to be where we need to be in five years. If I'm not at that 15, uh, 1700 number, um, I hope that I've at least deployed it correctly enough to where those numbers kind of correlate. Even if I have less, they correlate to where our projections are at. Um, um, I'm not afraid to, to miss my mark. You know, I, I shoot for this guy now. Um, and I know that I have um, some downfalls and that's where I put my, my team in place to kind of support me. But making sure that uh, that I hit those goals that we have for for legacy is going to be is going to be huge, and I, I do everything I can to get there. So, on that Kalamazoo building, does that owner know you now? Like, have you been in touch with them already? I have. Nice. Yep. I've been Good. in touch, and I said um, she has told me multiple times uh, I will never sell this building. Good. And I told her, <laughs> I said you are highly mistaken. Um, yeah. I will own this eventually, and. Uh, um, I'm the type, I've got a beautiful family. I've got a beautiful life behind me, but the best motivator for me is when I'm told I can't do it. And I'm like, you have no idea the beast you are going to unleash here. Cause I, I don't like being told no. So, mm -hmm. uh, and it's all playful. She's great. Um, she's been really awesome. Um, hopefully a couple of years from now I can, I can text you guys and say, uh, like here it is. So that's, that's the goal. Well, we're going to, you know, in a couple of years from now, we're going to start doing recap episodes, you know, where are That's they great, now man. kind of situation. So, um, you know, this, this would be a good touching point for that. And I, I think that's awesome, you know, keeping it playful um, and keeping that uh, line of communication up for, for the long term. I think that's awesome because, you know, she might have other deals too that, you know, end up coming into your favor as well, you know, in between uh, then and now. So you never Certainly. know what kind of comes in your lap in that. Certainly. Exactly. All right, this last one is how do our listeners get in touch with you? So if you got an Instagram, Facebook, website, phone number, email address, whatever you want to yeah. put out there, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Yeah, you can. Um, I'm on all the social media. So LinkedIn, um, Facebook, Instagram, it is TJ. Last name is C-R-E-M-E. A N S uh, Kermeens. Um, so Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, um, maybe Twitter. I'm not on there very often. Um, uh, you can check out legacy at uh, legacy dash reg.com. Um, that's just to track our journey, what we're doing, who we are, um, all of that. Um, I personally um, have invest with tj.com, which is just an avenue for people to get in and, and learn multifamily real estate. If that's something they want. And I always get flack for this, but you brought it up. So I appreciate it. Um, my phone number is 269-377-6232. And that is my personal cell phone. You are welcome to text or call me and let, uh, let, let, you know, let me know that you heard from, from the show. And I'd be happy to jump on a call and chat with you. So. Man, that is awesome. All right, guys, well, you heard <laughs> it here. If you were inspired by TJ's entire journey, Shoot him a text, give him a call, let him know personally. And if you like this episode, make sure to leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, Google, on our website at www. 
therealfi.com. You can leave a review there if you can't leave one anywhere else. We love your reviews. James and I, we do this out of passion, out of talking to great people, just like TJ. I got inspired today. Hopefully did you did too. So we'll catch you next time. Thanks, guys. Shout out to our number one listener, Todd. Text me if you hear this. See you later, guys. Thank you for listening to the Real FI podcast, where you learn from the investors that have lived the hard lessons for you. To connect with us during your pursuit of financial independence, be sure to join our community by following us on Instagram or emailing us at info at therealfi.com. If this content made you financially, mentally, physically, or spiritually richer, please make sure to leave us a positive review on your preferred content platform. Cheers to kicking the nine to five.